Paul, we have lots of great constraints now. Um, we have five pretty solid ones that give us a starting point, tells us what happens on the inside. So now how do we package that all together? How does that come together to give us this model that describes what we think is happening in the sun? Well, I think this is one of the great triumphs of um, second half of the 20th century astronomy is that people are actually able to work out models that met all these constraints. Now, one way you can do it is to start at the outside and say, OK, we can see density and temperature here. So it must be a bit hotter inside to allow the heat to come out and denser to support the weight. Yep. So you can take a step inwards and keep taking steps inwards. Each one starts where the other one finishes. At each stage we say, how much hotter and denser must it be to give us enough pressure to support against gravity and give us enough temperature gradient to allow the heat to flow out? So we're building kind of just little steps where one starts the other end to so keep going up and yep. up and up. So each level you'd say, okay, so at this level we've got this much density, this much pressure and that much temperature. It must therefore, as we go the next 10 kilometers in, go up by a certain amount to yeah. allow the heat to flow out and to allow the pressure to balance the gravity. So you kind of do these small chunks to put together the whole picture. Until you go to the middle and then you hope <laughs> that when you add it all up, you've got the right total mass and the right total. And I guess if you don't, energy. you can change your steps either way. Yes, but I mean, you've kind of fixed on what steps you can take here. That's true. Um, another way to do it, which is what I did as an undergraduate, was you just say, let's assume it fits a particular mathematical function, a particular curve, uh -huh. and we adjust the slope of the curve so it has the right heat flow and the right pressure gradient and try and fit all the constraints. So instead of doing it chunk by chunk, you do from the beginning to the end and figure out which combination works best. Yes. And so what people will do is they will try and come up with something. And it turns out that either of these techniques, you can actually come up with something that starts at the right place meets the constraints all the way around and at least approximately gives you the right total energy consumption and the right total density. So they both can give us a model, an understanding of the sun that fits all of those five pretty stringent constraints. Yeah, that's kind of remarkable that uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's kind of people thinking, well, there's, there's a lot of things to fit here and yet a, a model that obeys the laws of physics as we understand it, that obeys the nuclear energy reactions, that obeys our laws of conduction and radiation, it does actually seem to fit the entire thing. And here's what it gives us. So this is what our current best models tell us okay. for temperature as you go through the sun. So really, really hot, 15 million Kelvin or so. A bit more than 15 million in the centre, yes. And the density, uh, very, very low. Most of the sun is much less dense than the air in this room. The outer layers of the sun is actually a density that would be a hard vacuum on Earth, about 6,000 times less than what I'm breathing right now. And then it gets really dense just in the middle. Yeah, I guess because we, we kind of always often think that the sun is this really dense object. And it is in the middle, but most of it's very tenuous indeed. So then you said 6,000 times less than the air in here? Yep. That's if it was not, oxygen, you couldn't breathe it. That's not very dense at all. So this is what the sun actually looks like, and this is what it would look like if we could actually see where the mass was, which is most of the mass is in a small lump in the middle, and then it's surrounded by a very tenuous atmosphere. This atmosphere is opaque because it's so hot, it's ionized, the light can't get through it. Oh, uh, okay, I was going to say, because if, if it's so thin, couldn't we just see the core of the sun? No, but this is a very thin atmosphere, but it's a very thin, opaque, yeah. ionized atmosphere. So what we see as the radius of the sun is probably not really true. I mean, yeah. it's, not, it's not, not like the Earth. There's no solid surface. You can't say... This is the surface of the Earth. All you can say is that uh, the sun just gets dense, less and less dense as you go out. Yep. And at some arbitrary level, we say this is the edge. Um, we'll talk about, about more about the photosphere yep. next time. But uh, most of it's in the middle. And if you uh, see an artist's impression of all the different layers, so you've got the sun's core. Yep. And this is roughly the middle 20, 25%. And that's where all the fusion takes place. So fusion's taking place at that super dense area that's 15 million Kelvin. And incredibly dense, 150 tons per cubic meter of density. So far denser than anything we can produce on Earth, which is what you need to produce nuclear fusion. That's right. And then you've got the next layer out, which is getting pretty thin already. There's yep. no fusion happening there. That's just the heat working its way out. So, our so with that model, that heat is coming out, coming to that other layer. So hotter so on the inside. Yes. So most of the sun is just the blanket pushing down on that central 25%, yep. making that central 25% dense and hot enough to go nuclear fusion. Okay. And most of this blanket, there's no convection. It's just radiative, the photons doing Counts. their random walk around. And actually it takes them tens of thousands of years to get from the core to the surface. Okay. So the, the sunlight we're seeing now was probably emitted, you know, like during the last ice age sometime. Oh, so, okay. In the direction of the sun, and it's been 
fighting its way from the core through this radiation. Slowly slowly bubbling its way up. Throughout the evolution of human history. That's right. And then out in the rather tenuous outer regions of the sun, you actually do start to get convection. So this is where the convection, less the radiation, start to take place. Yes, that carries the heat much faster through this region because by flowing the gas, that allows it easier. Then eventually it reaches the surface and can escape out as radiation so we can see it, taking eight minutes to get to the surface. So you have tens of thousands of years to get from there to there, and then the other 99.9% of the journey takes eight minutes. (laughs) So this is our model of the sun, um, and it meets all these constraints. But would you actually believe it? Well, I mean, I guess this is a good question, right? So we don't go inside the sun. We haven't dug the sun up. We're not making a new sun here. We have five constraints. Now, I'll give you the constraints are pretty good, but what if we mess something up? What if there's a new constraint that changes this whole model? Yeah, I mean, it looks pretty good because these are very tough constraints. It's not easy for a model to fit them, but a model that obeys the laws of physics does fit them all. So that's... But the pip physics have been proven wrong in the past. Yeah. We were just talking about Kelvin, thinking of this coincidence between the two <laughs> yeah. ages. And, and it was the geologists who were wrong. Yes, so it's, um, yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, but what I really believe, I'd like to see some more tests. And luckily there are some more tests we can do that weren't dreamt of when these models were come up with in the 1950s and 60s. And as you said in the beginning, so a good model not only describes what the observations you have, but can be tested against new ones that you haven't have and either be validated or disproved. Yes, I mean, the trouble is scientists are very good at fitting things we already know about. We're good at fitting those lines and fitting the data. I think if you give anyone enough data, they will always be able to come up with a compact, elegant model to explain it. But the real test is whether it can predict something new that hasn't been seen at the time and get that right. And so now we have predictions that were made by this model that we've now tested. 